Good morning, beloved. We'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, and hopefully covering all of chapter 13. But if you remember, our series in 1 Corinthians is called Be a Believer. And as we just sang, without love, it all means something. We're going to see today in chapter 13 that really love is a more excellent way. More excellent way than what, you ask? Well, hopefully we'll see a little bit of that. But as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 28 through all of 13, Paul wants to show us, and I believe the Holy Spirit is trying to show us and show the church that to be a believer, to be a body member of the church, we need love. Well, what is love? Well, we'll talk about all that later. I'm not going to sing that old song, What is Love? Baby, don't. I just did sing it, so I apologize. Maybe I can cut that out before it goes online, but I don't know. 1 Corinthians, the refresher, is written by Paul to the church in Corinth. It was the Isthmus of Greece, this little connecting between two big parts of Greece. It was a port city, a major city. And there was a saying, like we said again last week, to live like a Corinthian was the wild lifestyle. It wasn't necessarily a compliment to live like a Corinthian, but it's what some people did. And that's unfortunately it snuck into the church that the society and uh, garbage of society had gotten in around them. And part of that was doing things that they thought were loving that weren't loving at all. And Corinthians are a pair of corrective letters. Apparently there was another letter that was lost. But Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant about Israel, the gifts, or Jesus' return. And chapter 12 and chapter 14 give us good insight in the gifts and what they're used. And we're going to look at them a little bit today. But also, love is a part of that. And we're going to look at that. And love comes from the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at that. Again, remember his work, para alongside and within, and then epi, to fill you overflowing. And last week we looked at the members of the physical body, not membership, but limbs, parts, organs, eyes, legs, ears, all the different parts of the body and how God had set them in the right places. The eye we saw couldn't be a leg and also shouldn't want to be a leg. In the same sense, the leg can't be an eye, but it shouldn't say that the eye isn't needed. That God has set them each in the body, and without them, where would the body be? If it was all ears, it's not really a body. It's just a weird thing of ears running down the street. But this week, we're going to look at parts of the church, the body of Christ. And I'm going to say this, the soul of the believer, which is love. It's not a motto. It's not a creed. It's not an action. I'm sorry. It's an action and attitude towards God and one another. That's what love is. It's not a motto. It's not a creed. It's an action and attitude toward God and one another. In other words, it is both it is both enabling and is itself supernatural service. That real love is both a thing and also an action. Next week or next time we'll look at certain gifts, their power and their proper usage in the church. But this morning, let's get right into it and let's pray. God, this morning we ask that as we come to your word, God, you would show us your word, that you would speak things to us through me, through your word, but things that maybe I didn't even write down or think of, but things that are really, hopefully none of the things that are done are my thinking, but are from you, God. And we pray that your word would flow forth and reach the nations and bless your people this morning. In Jesus' name, we love you, God, because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at the last three verses of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians. It says in verse 28, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, Paul says? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have the gift of uh, healings? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? He closes out. He says, But earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. There's a bit to unpack there, and we're going to spend a little bit of time there, but the first point I want to bring up is that he says, has appointed. In verse 28, And God has appointed. And you know, that's the same word that he used a couple of verses earlier when he says, has set the members, has set the body parts in order, has appointed them 
to be there. That just as God designed each body part, organ and limb, like we looked at last week, and put them in their proper place, right? Your arms are where the arms go, the legs are where the legs go. And they also function the way they should. Although you can walk on your hands, it's easier to walk on your feet. That just as he did that with the body part, so he's done it with each believer. With the gifts that he's given to each believer. Just as an arm is gifted with throwing and a leg is gifted with kicking, so you as a believer, so your eye as a believer, God has given each of us gifts, I believe more than one, sometimes many, sometimes we can seek them, that fit us and fit who he made us to be. If he made you to be a spiritual leg, he's going to give you the gift of spiritual kicking, so to speak. And why? Because he's put us to be in his body. He's ordained us, he set us, he set us apart to be a part of his body on earth until he returns the church. Just as your leg will hopefully be with you for the rest of your life, God wants you to be a part of the church for the rest of your life. So what are these parts of the church? Well, Paul outlines them, and this is the first list of several we'll look at today. I'm going to read through them, and then I'll go back and discuss each of them. So first, and he gives them in this order on purpose, these parts of the church, these body members of the church, Apostles, that's lowercase a, apostles. Prophets, all lowercase letters here, it's not like proper nouns. Teachers. And then he says, after that, miracles, number four. Number five, gifts of healing. Number six, helps. Number seven, administrations, the word is actually governments. Uh, And number eight, varieties of tongues, and by inference, their interpretation. So we'll go back and look at these, but why are they in this order? Well, I believe that the best are at the top of the list and the worst, so to speak, are at the bottom of the list, but they're really not better or worse than than each other. I think what Paul and the Holy Spirit is trying to show us here is that they are more useful or more serviceable or more advantageous or perhaps even could be said more excellent in some way for eternal service that the higher up on the list they are, the more benefit they have to the body at large, to the kingdom of heaven as it advances. And towards the bottom, so to speak, of the list, perhaps it's more beneficial to the local body or even just to the individual, as we'll see in chapter 14 with tongues. That they're all necessary, they're all important, but there's an authority of hierarchy there. There's an impact of eternity based on these better or more excellent gifts. So with that being said, let's look at them and remember that if you have number eight and you're not number one, in God's economy, the the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It doesn't mean that you're lesser of a believer. It doesn't mean that you're more holy of a believer if you have one or the other. It just means that this is where God has set you in his body on earth And granted, there are many people out there who might only have tongues as a gift, but may even have more reward in heaven than some of those who might be considered apostles. So please don't look at this with earthly eyes. Well, I'm only number eight. I want to be number one. And yet we'll see that there should be a healthy desire for these as we go on. So without further blabbing of my tongue, let's look at apostles. So again, I said this is lowercase a because an apostle is a delegate, a messenger, one who's sent forth with orders, an eminent Christian teacher like Barnabas, Timothy, and Silvanus. I believe it's also someone who's a church planner, a denomination leadership, a large figure like someone like Jack Hibbs, Franklin Graham, or John Piper, where God has raised them up as pillars, as apostles, as sent out ones, as messengers of him for the church. Number one, to lead the church as a whole on earth. Not that they're on Jesus' throne and we kiss their ring, but that they're apostles. They are sent out ones. Now, there's an uppercase apostle, right? An uppercase apostle would be one like the 12, like Paul, like Matthew, like these guys who were a member of the original crew of Jesus that saw him firsthand and gave firsthand account of them. But we too, as believers, have firsthand accounts of Jesus. So does that qualify them somehow more than us? Yes, in a sense, because they walked with him on earth. They heard him physically and saw him. So that the, there was an element of, of what God used them to plant the church but it was by his Holy Spirit. We're his disciples too. We follow him too on earth. 
we look to him too. We hear his voice as well, although it's not in the physical realm. So apostles aren't just these 12 guys. They are important and they should be listened to. And that's why their words are in scripture and we, and we follow them because that's what God has ordained. But that doesn't mean that there's not a lowercase apostle, one who has sent out. In fact, one thing you might notice is missing from this list is a missionary. Where's the gift of missions? Where's the gift of being a missionary? It's not listed here as we would say it. In fact, Jesus says to everybody, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them and baptizing them in my name, right? To do the things that I've commanded. So we are all called to do missions. In fact, Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and the others went on missionary journeys. But as Paul say, my gift is that of being a missionary? No. Now, I'm not trying to degrade missions at all. I'm not. In fact, missions are something we all are called to do, whether it's to pray, to send, or to go. But I think missionary, in some sense, is really a gift of apostleship. That someone who is called to go, called to go out, goes where, they're, where God has called them to go to spread the word of God, whether that's in, in evangelism, and eventually planting a church there. You go to an unreached people, you tell them about Jesus, well, then what happens? A church is planted, right? Same way. If God has called people out to plant a church, that's apostleship. If God, if God has called someone to be over a church and over a fellowship or over a denomination, I think in some sense, that's apostleship. They're a messenger, one sent forth with orders. But are we not in some sense? Now, I'm not saying we're all apostles, because that's what Paul says, right? Are all? No. But in some sense, we are all called to do the apostle thing. We are all sent out with orders. Go, make disciples of all nations. The next one, prophets. Well, this word is interpreter of oracles or hidden things. In the Bible, it's someone who speaks forth the truth of God. And that's not just prophecy in the sense of like John the, uh, John on the, the disciple, uh, John the apostle on the island of Patmos, speaking the things which are and which are to come after this, right? the future things in Revelation, but it's also speaking forth the things of God. You think about John the Baptist, or you think about Elijah, these guys who heard from God directly and spoke forth. And I believe that there's an office of a prophet, someone who like uh, is ordained to speak to a nation, in a sense like Billy Graham, even though he's an evangelist. God had called him basically to speak to America and speak to the world, but he wasn't a, he wasn't a pastor in the sense of he has a church. His church was... The nation and much like the prophets were called as prophets to the nations and just as there's an uppercase p so to speak there's also a lowercase p that god has gifted us like he said to jeremiah right i have ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations that i have given you my word to speak to people now this can be a gift too to where god gives you a word of prophecy just to speak into someone's life that's not your word it's god's word but it's speaking forth the truth of god simply that when we speak forth it and speak forth with the, the authority that God says that is wrong, that is right, because God says it, in a sense, that's prophecy. Some of us are called to do that. Now, you can be an apostle and a prophet. You can be an apostle and a teacher. You can be a prophet and a teacher. You can have tongues and be a teacher. So that there's all these things that go on. It could be an office you have to where this is your life calling, or it could be something that you find yourself also doing alongside another gift, right? Just as you might be really good at hockey, you might also be really good at drawing. But there's different gifts that God has given us, right? There's different callings and different measures to which these gifts will be exercised in our lives. Let's go on. Teachers. And remember this because we're going to see that word again later. This is one uh, who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of man. Teaches about the Bible, what the Bible says, but then also our, ability, our, our role to fulfill them. Like in the church. The pastor teacher. The word pastor is shepherd or overseer, one who guides, helps guide people's lives, not in the sense where they control someone's lives, but they say, This is what the word of God says, and this is how it applies to our body. In a sense, there's also a little prophecy there as well, speaking into the body about what the things of God are, but also saying, This is how we need to apply them. This is what God says. This is how we respond to that individually, personally. Come to, you know, someone comes to a pastor for guidance and advice the pastor should say well what is the lord speaking to you what is, well this is what the bible says do not steal so don't steal that's teaching the word of god right and after that it says after that this other one comes so i think 
It might just be a thing of language, but also my gut says, maybe even the Spirit of God says, that these are the roles that lead the church. Apostles, prophets, and teachers. These are the ones that guide the church, that uh, not enshrine, so to speak, the Word of God, but make sure that doctrine is sound that guard the word of God and say, this is the word of God. We are not going to change it. Instead, we need to be changed by it. And we need to bring it to the world that the world might be changed by it. And so after that come these other gifts that are great, are important, are part of the body just as much as the others. But again, it would be like having, remember, who's the head of the body? Jesus, right? And then it's apostles. Then, you know, number zero, Jesus is above all this, right? Everything comes from God above. But miracles, gifts of healings, help, administration, variety of tongues, these are not the things that should lead the church. Really, the first three, in a sense, lead the church. The next five help the body. Right? The role of a pastor teacher is to equip the saints for the working of the ministry. That the job of the first three is to get the rest of the body to do what the body is doing. In a sense, the nervous system. In a sense, the brain. In a sense, uh, those kind of organs, Right? Well, the other one should have, because Jesus said those who seek after miracles, right? It's a, a, a wicked and adulterous generation. Miracles shouldn't be the things we're seeking after. Look at, you will see on the news sometimes that there, and down in South America, that there's an idol of Mary, and they won't call it an idol, but it's an idol of Mary, and it's weeping blood, or it's crying, and people will flock all over, and wow, and pray to it. That's not a godly miracle. God's not going to draw attention away from his word, away from his spirit, away from his work to some stone thing made with human hands to get them to worship his mom who's just a person but that's what people do they go after miracles so that's not what this is saying if we look at miracles it's the same word for the power of the holy spirit i find this interesting because the word is dunamis paul says and dunamis and when we talk about the power of the holy spirit the word is dunamis that's where we get dynamite like explosion that is this power unearthly power that goes out we see this in the disciples. We see this in Paul. Paul got bit by a snake, a viper. He didn't die from it. That's a miracle. But it wasn't Paul. They wanted to worship Paul because of it, but it wasn't Paul. But his strength, power, ability for performing those miracles. And I think it ties into number five with the gifts of healings. But remember, that it was like uh, the people would, Peter would go down the street and people would just step into his shadow just to be healed by him or wanted to touch his handkerchief, or the lady just touched the hem of Jesus' garment, and there was a miracle. But it was a miracle for her to be healed, a miracle to lead her to Jesus. It wasn't a miracle to follow after the miracle, right? It was a miracle to bless that person, to heal that person personally, and then from that healing, bring others to, to faith in Jesus. And we see that in all the places where the Word of God isn't, that these gifts happen because... God wants to bring attention to his word through the healing. And when the healing happens here, we, we don't even pay attention to God's word anymore. We idolize the healing, right? But it still happens. And if you remember from last week in Acts, the deacons were full of the Holy Spirit. That even await tables required being full of the Holy Spirit. Required the dunamis power, the dynamite power, to serve God in practical ways properly. And again, that ties into administrations, as we'll see here in a minute. There's gifts of healings, number five. Healing, remedy, medicine. That is what it is. And remember, this isn't an office. This is a gift of healings. That when we pray that God will heal someone, we're asking God, please give them the gift of a healing. Please, through us, give them a gift of being well again, that they may follow you and know you. We see that like Peter's mom, the little girl, the servant, right? They're all healed. Gifts of healings. It wasn't... Jesus went, out, went around and healed... But his ministry wasn't primarily one of come like a doctor, right? He would heal people and people would come to a healing, but a lot of times it was so that he could show them that he had the power to forgive sins, the power to heal their spirit, that healing their body, their body would ultimately die again. Even poor Lazarus, who was rose from the dead, he would die again. So healings is great. And we should all desire it, but a lot of times when we desire it, we want it for ourselves. Look at me. I have a gift of healing. Pay me and I'll come to your church and we'll have a service and I'll heal everybody. That's not how it works. It's not like teaching where you can invite a teacher to come to the church and he'll teach everybody by the Spirit. It does, healing doesn't work that way. Healing is handed out by God when he chooses. Helps. It really means to aid, to help, 
to be an assistant. And the best type of assistants are ones that don't have to be asked. They see and they do. And I believe this is the best ministry to have around you, but also the best ministry to be when you're around others. When someone else is doing the work of God, to come alongside them and just start doing. Maybe ask them once, what do you need done? But don't ask them all the time. Just go and do what they need done so they don't need to think about it. Just like the deacons and the apostles. The deacons waited at the table so the apostles could pay attention to the word of God. Remember, they held Moses' hands up. But assistance, a member of the church back in New York, in the office, people would help. People would help fold chairs. People would help others when they needed to move. People would help go visit others. That people are always helping each other in a healthy body. It wasn't like the hand saying, no shoe, I'm not going to help you get your, your, no foot, I'm not going to help you get your shoe on. The hands are going to go and help. The hands are going to make sure that the shoe is tied, that the foot's not tripping over itself. That sometimes the toenail has to get clipped. Otherwise, the toe overgrows and hurts the whole body. That's what helps is. Administration or governments. It's not the government down in D.C., but it's the act of governing. Notice that this is number seven on the list. This isn't number one on the list. This isn't the one that guides the church, that leads the church, but it helps. But maybe it's a board. Maybe it's a group of elders, but I believe it's also organization. People who, so to speak, run the business, quote unquote, of the ministry. Make sure the bills are paid. Make sure the files in order. Make sure the taxes are filed. Make sure that the power, that the power is on. Make sure that uh, the food in the refrigerator is stocked up. Make, make sure that the food pantry is covered. Make sure that people are in their place on Sunday to serve God in their different ministries as administration. You know, the word secretary is outdated. The, the lady who had help in an office and type and answer phones. Now it can be anybody. Fine. But it's called administrative assistant. Administ- helping with the administration of these things. You know, I work in technology and the administrator account on a web server is one that's able to log in and change all the settings and make sure everything is working and has power to touch everything and make sure that it's working and fix it when it's broken or set it up to do what it needs to do. And so should be the church. But administrator doesn't run everything. Administrator makes sure everything is running. I believe that's part of the way the the board should work. And then lastly, but not leastly, is in a way, is varieties of tongues. And I believe interpretation. Now this can be another dialect. A tongue is a word for language. So varieties of languages, that's heavenly or earthly. And we'll look at this more in the next chapter. But this is that personal prayer language to God that some folks have. I believe I have. I'm not going to sit here and pray in tongues in front of you unless I felt really led. And even then, if it happened in our group, as we'll see, one or, once or twice, and that's it. If there's no interpretation. But tongues builds up the believer while prophecy edifies the church. And we'll see more of that next time. So these are it. The eight parts of the church. Like I said, you can probably... And prob- you can probably have and probably do multiple of these giftings and callings. Remember, they're from and by and through the Holy Spirit. They cannot be exercised apart from Him. Just because you have a natural talent, whether it be singing in a band and leading a band, doesn't mean that you're a worship leader or that you're called to lead worship. Just because you're great at teaching at a college doesn't mean God has called you to be a Bible teacher. Because teaching practical things and teaching spiritual things are two completely different matters. Because there's a distinctly spirit-led, spirit-given, and intrinsic quality to each of these gifts. And by extension, each of the offices that might come from the, the, the bestowing of these gifts on someone. And it requires the Holy Spirit to operate. If I'm called to be a Bible teacher, the only way anyone can learn anything from the Bible through me is if the Holy Spirit teaches them through me. It's not apart from Him. It is not by Him. It is not, I mean, sorry, it is not apart from Him. It is by Him 
It is through Him, and it is for Him. And the glory is for Him too. If you learned something this morning in this message or listening online, it's because God taught you. Me and myself, I'm not able to teach you. But what I am able to do by His Spirit and hopefully His gifting is go to Him and say, Lord, open the Scriptures to me. God, speak through me. Use my time, use my mind, use my body, use my mouth. But God, use your spirit to exercise through your body. And the same thing with you too. The gifts God has given you to do. Even if he has given you a voice to sing, maybe he has called you to lead worship. Maybe he has given you a heart that others might worship and come to worship him. And you love worshiping God and just want others to do the same and just want to lead them to do the same. Not that you want to be on the stage and be seen, but that you want to be on the stage that you might let Jesus be seen in the worship. That as you lead others in the song with your pretty voice or your ability to play an instrument, that others are led into his presence and can turn their hearts through him through the gifts he's given you. Not that you get a paycheck or a pat on the back or a poster, but that people give their paycheck to Jesus and put his poster on their wall, so to speak. Because remember, they are giftings, they are callings, they are not earnings. You can't earn them. You can't buy them. You can't learn them if they haven't been given to you. If they've been given to you, you can learn how to use them and exercise them. But you can't go down the store and buy a book on how to be whatever if you're not called to be whatever. And Paul says, I want to show you a more excellent way. And in that way, I think some denominations, some churches have misplaced their concern. Because remember, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? One is the power to come alongside us. To, if you're an unbeliever, to convict you of unrighteousness, of Jesus, and of judgment, and of sin. And to get you to accept Jesus. And then what you do is He comes inside you. And so God lives inside you, but you're still not overflowing yet with the gifts. I think a lot of churches, a lot of ministries, a lot of believers stop there. And they're doing good. God is in them, and them, and verse epi, right? He's in side them. They're living. They love God. They go to church. They read the Bible. They might even tell others about Jesus. But hear me out because I don't get it right all the time either. But my point is, it's not about getting it right, but about the focus of their life. Their life is not focused on what God is calling them to do to advance his kingdom. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to work and having a day job, right? I go to work and have a day job, but that's not the calling of my life. And maybe for some it is that they might know that God has called them to start a business or to be in business and to make money to then send missionaries out, right? And that's what they feel called to do. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a lot of believers who have God inside them, have the Holy Spirit within them, but they go about life in a sense not very much differently than they used to or the world did. They're not concerned about how I'm going to live my life to further the kingdom. That when I make a decision to choose a new job, it's not just because I want more money or things are going wrong or I want to move, but does God want me to move? Well, God might be calling me to go to Florida, so let me start looking for work in Florida and see if God will open up a door. Or I'm going to college because I want to be whatever, (laughs) But does God want you to go to college? Does God called you to do that thing that you need to go to college for? Right? That that's the difference. Is living a life following Jesus to advance his kingdom. And I believe that comes by epi. By the filling of the Holy Spirit. That God, please fill me. God, change the direction of my life. Because I know in the end of the day, it's all vanity without you. And I don't want to end up in heaven and go, wow, I wasted my life on being a stockbroker. Or whatever it is. And that's the epi life, to live for God's kingdom. And everything else falls under that calling. So Paul says, after that, miracles. So again, seeking miracles isn't what it's about. It's that solid leadership, that solid instruction is what the church is built on. Like like Jesus said to Peter, the gospel is what I'm going to build my church upon, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. So are all one part, where would the body be? And the same here. The body can't function if we're all the same part. And as the church grows, as the pastor and the leadership are spreading the word of God through apostleship, prophecy, and teaching, 
to equip the saints for the work in the ministry. Some are going to be raised up as other pastors, teachers, and apostles. Some are going to be raised up as help. Some are going to be raised up as and see that they have these other gifts that they can use. And at some point, the church is split. As these leaders are raised up, they're going to sense the call of God on their life to maybe go out and start another church. And it may be three blocks down the road. Now, granted, God likes to send people to where the gospel hasn't gone, and we should seek to go, like Japan, where there's not another ministry that we're building on. We should always consider that. But at the same time, if God calls you to go down the street, go down the street. It should be healthy. We should be able to help each other and help the church and not say, no, 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 this is my territory. Well, what if God wants to use them there? It's his church, it's his body, it's his people. Why do we get so territorial? But on the same time, there's also blessed subtraction where people think that they're called, think that they, and they start causing problems in the church because they're trying to usurp the authority of the leaders of the church and they should be sent out in another way. That's not the focus of our message today. Our focus is the gifts and desiring them, Paul says. To desire the best gifts. That word is actually can be translated to covet the best gifts. To want those gifts for yourself. Not in a sinful covetousness, but man, God, if you would make me a pastor, if you would make me, uh, if you would give me the gift of healing, God, if you would uh, call me to go out and be an apostle, Lord, I would love to be sent out by you. God loves to give us the desires of our heart, right? Why would God not, if you are desiring to teach God's word, now that's a little separate message, but why wouldn't God want to use you and equip you for that? Now he might show you at some point there's something wrong or it's not what I've called you to do, I've called you to something else, right? But to seek that and in seeking that, God will get you on the right path. But that doesn't mean that everyone should be teachers, but we should desire them. In fact, James says in James 3, 1 through 2, My brethren, not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. It's better to sit on the couch and listen to the Word of God than it is to stand up here and to teach it. Because when I get to heaven, God's going to bring all this up. Where I got it wrong, where my life went wrong, it didn't match up to this, I'm probably going to get less rewards. God's going to go, not only did you know it, but you stood up there and proclaimed it and you still didn't obey it? There's less excuse. There's no excuse. Because he says, for if we, st- we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. I'm not a perfect man. I struggle bridling my body. I do this because I know God has called me to do this. Sometimes I don't want to do this. I would rather do anything else sometimes, but I can't. I can't. And if God says one day I shouldn't, well, I hope I won't. But this word is master, didaskalos. It's the same as the word teacher before. Let not many become masters. Letters to Timothy, Titus, speak of qualification for these roles. They require a life that's personally, familiarly, and publicly to be in order. Then in order to fulfill these callings in life, the rest has to be in order. And that's a whole nother message. So it's not just about desire, but it's about calling and desire and faithfulness. And the church will be ordered, will have all of these. There's different folks in different stages of development. And again, like I said, classes can't teach it or, or, or give the gifts. But teaching can lead to understanding of them in their operation. That was some of the best parts about growing up in the church back in New York was as the leadership saw gifts among the people, they would give them opportunity to fulfill those gifts. Teach on a Wednesday. Teach at youth group. Lead a home group. right? Encourage people to exercise their gifts. And as they were exercised and saw fruit in them, things would happen. People would be raised up. Ordainment would take place. Because the church needs all of these. But I think on the flip side... Sometimes in the church, where there's good teaching, everyone thinks that they need to be a teacher, or that teaching is the best gift, or that's the only gift to seek after, and we know that it's not. Or that people on the flip side also think, oh, just like the body members, right? That, oh, I'm not a teacher, so I must not have any gifts. No, not at all. Teaching, again, for the third time, is about equipping of the saints 
to do the work of the ministry. That the teaching on Sunday, the teaching on Wednesday, the podcast you might listen to is about equipping you and the hearers to then go out to do the work of the ministry. That Sunday is not, is not the culmination of ministry, that everything leads to Sunday, but Sunday is the beginning of ministry, that everything flows out of Sunday, so to speak. That as you come to church on a Sunday, you then go out the rest of the week and live your ministry for God. The pastor sits in the office a week or goes does visits or sometimes if he doesn't have a job in the world is not around unbelievers as much as you but you go to a job or around unbelievers you go to school you go to this event you go to the supermarket your ministry is out there your ministry is larger in a sense greater than the ministry in a sense that's on the sunday morning and again trying to compare with earthly eyes it's hard to make those comparisons because spiritual eyes it's not viewed that way but i think in the same way that jesus says you will go and do greater things than me the same sense jesus was in a sense that church service for the disciples and the disciples were going to go back to their towns and their friends and their families and minister to them there so with that if you're not naturally graceful you're not going to learn how to become a ballerina you can try you can see people trying to be a ballerina and you can just tell that they're not graceful enough or like my son, who moves like a ninja. I could play hockey as a kid. I could play sports. I jumped on my roller blades. But I do not move like my son, Jacob. He kicks and twirls and moves his body. That just is painful for me to think about. He'd be a much better ninja if he went to school than if I went to ninja school. It's the same thing with you and I. You might have the gift of singing or some compassion where you'll be better at fulfilling that role than I ever will. And God needs you to do that just as he needs me to do what I need to do. Again, we're not to look at each other and compare ourselves to each other. And the scripture is brief here, so I'm not going to spend more time here. But Paul says a more excellent way that despite all this, despite all these great things, these great gifts and callings, that there's a more excellent way. That it's not about the giftings. It's not about the callings. It's not about the office. There's something more excellent. And it's a more excellent way. It's not a more excellent thing. And I like that the Greek word is actually hyperbole. Like hyperbole is telling something greater than it really is. It's a magnificent or throwing beyond that this way, throwing that snowball is far beyond these gifts and callings that these gifts have some measure, but they only work when they're powered by the more excellent way, which as we'll see is something called agape love. There is a vineyard of the Lord, there is a vineyard for us soul. With all our troubles left behind the door, we drink first light until...